Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. A lot of energy in this room tonight. I'm just, uh, I'm feeling it. Uh, it's very, uh, very loud, and, you know, everybody's, uh, everybody's having a good time. So I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, this is, uh, this is a, I think it's like a 12-week workshop uh, that we're doing. Each week is on a step. Uh, my friend Karen uh, C. from Morris Plains is doing the odd number steps, and uh, me and some of my friends are doing the even. So we're having a good time with it. Uh, anyway, tonight is on step eight. Uh, step eight is becoming willing to try to go back out and set right some of the damage that we've caused out there uh, through running our lives on self-will and being alcoholic, you know, if you're alcoholic, you're usually going to leave a, a trail of debris behind you of one kind or another. So becoming willing. Now, how do you become willing to do this? I remember, uh, I remember being in, uh, in the, the treatment center that I signed myself into in, I think it was like March of 1989. Uh, I got to the point where I really thought alcohol was going to kill me. So I signed myself into a treatment center. And I remember that was about the first time I really saw the steps up on the wall. Because they had the shade with the steps up on the wall. And I remember looking at becoming willing to, to make amends and then, you know, made direct amends to, to those that I had harmed. And I thought, you know, first of all, I didn't understand why in the world you would want to do that. Why, why would that be necessary? What, what relevance does that have? How does that connect to my drinking? And, you know, I, I didn't have a clue, so it wasn't... You know, also, I didn't want to do it. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I didn't want uh, to make complete amends to everybody at harm. I'd harmed a lot of people. And I was very ashamed about, uh, about some of this stuff. I was, uh, you know, like... Uh, listing everybody I had harmed and going up and knocking on their door was not something that I even thought I could possibly ever do. Uh, that was so remote from anything that I thought I had the emotional fortitude to do that, you know, uh, I just put it in the back of my mind. They're, they're, you know, uh, alcoholism is an unorthodox uh, illness. So often we start to understand what it really is as we're involved in a recovery process. You know, we, we literally catch alcoholism while we're in AA, usually. That usually is what happens. Um, I didn't understand alcoholism. I thought that alcoholism was drinking too much. I really did. Uh, I knew that I drank too much. I knew from the very, very early days of drinking that I drank too much. An alcoholic, though, looked to me like somebody who had drank too much for a really long period of time and made a lot of bad choices in their life. And usually they ended up on skid row or you know, dying of uh, uh, liver disease or something like that. I, you know, I didn't know what it was. I knew, though, that I drank a lot, and I knew that the way I drank was not, not normal. Um, in my early days, when I started drinking, I started drinking with a lot of non-alcoholics. I think we all do in our early days. You know, when we're 13 or 15 or 18 or whatever, we, we start drinking with whoever we start drinking with. And... Again, I don't know about you, but I noticed right away that the reaction other people had to alcohol was different than mine. I got drunk out of my mind. Like practically every time I drank, I, I allowed myself to be overserved. I don't know if, uh, if that's everybody's experience, but it was mine. And there were people who could seem to handle their liquor. Instead of having 12 beers, they would have three. Instead of, you know, doing 15 shots, they would do two or three, and they would, they would be fine. But that's not how I went after this thing called alcohol. So if you would have asked me in the early days, was I alcoholic, you know, I, I, I would have said, look, maybe I, have a, maybe I have a drinking problem, you know, maybe I drink too much, or maybe I party, you know. Uh, and what happened is over the years I started drinking more and more with people that drank like me, people that partied like me the hardcore people. I went from, um, 
uh, I went from being in you know regular classes in my first year in high school uh, to getting put in the uh, the work study program. You know the basically the program for for the morons. Uh, they kind of push you through and graduate you without you really having to do any tests or anything. You know, and that's that's where I was because uh, by the time I really started partying, there was not a lot of energy left to do like schoolwork and stuff like that. I I. I just wasn't doing it, wasn't interested. Uh, I was the guy looking out the window, waiting to be able to go through that sign that says exit, you know, uh, and that couldn't be soon enough for me. So I knew that I had, I had an issue with alcohol. I knew that I drank more than other people. I knew that I got drunk more than other people. But, it, you know, the red flags weren't up. Um, I was having fun with it. Now, along the, along the way, um, in my life, uh, I can date, uh, I can basically date starting to do bad things with uh, the death of my father. Um, my father died three days into my 12th birthday, and it, it shattered my mother enough so that she really wasn't present as far as being able to take care of me. And I kind of spun out of control right around that time. And that's when I started to uh, get involved in drinking drugs, crimes, you know, getting in trouble, um, doing things that were, uh, were stupid and illegal. That's about the time that that started to happen. Um, and, you know, looking back on it, I love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous because it is such a, a barometer for me of where I was uh, where I am today and hopefully where, uh, where I'll be going. Uh, it talks about uh, selfishness and self-centeredness being the root of our troubles. Now, you wouldn't have been able to convince me that I was selfish back when, uh, in the earlier days when I was drinking because I would, I would buy you booze if you didn't have any money. or you know, I, I, If somebody needed help, I'd go across town and help them. I, I was what I saw as a very generous uh, type of a person, a helpful person. But when you look really closely at my life, you'll see that there's a, there's a thread of selfishness and there's a thread of self-centeredness very, very deep within, uh, within my character and w- within my operational methodology. Uh, I would do things for you, but I would expect things back. I would keep track of the people who owe me. Uh, and... I would never do anything for fun and for free, just to do a good deed. There would always have to be some kind of outcome that I would be able to attach that action to. And, you know, looking at, looking at my life, um, from the very earliest days, um, I was uh, trapped in, they, they talk in the big book about the bondage of self. The bondage of self, what a great description that is of what my real problem was. Uh, I love the quote by Albert Einstein. Uh, he quote, his quote, uh, one of the quotes that I like uh, so much of his is, mankind's uh, biggest delusion is that they think there's more than one of us here. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of someone caught in self-centeredness and self-delusion. Uh, the alcoholic is like the island, and, and they relate to everything outside themselves as how it's going to affect them. Uh, there's not a lot of selflessness. There's not a lot of uh, true compassion uh, within the alcoholic because the alcoholic really thinks that, you know, this whole thing is about them. And, you know, uh, uh, Things have to happen in a certain way. We need to be in control of our environment. We need to know what's going on. We, we, have, a, we have an unnatural attachment to uh, this, this self-awareness uh, that doesn't seem to really happen with, with normal people. Normal people can very easily think about their actions and how their effa- actions are affecting other people. I never did, you know. I thought about what my actions were going to cause me and how they were going to affect me. So, you know, in the big book, it basically paints the picture of the alcoholic's true problem, the true nature of the malady, 
is this self-awareness, this self-centeredness. Self-seeking is our behaviors and attitudes about what we don't have that we want. Our selfishness is about our behaviors and attitudes about what we have that we don't want to lose or share. Uh, Self-centeredness is our perspective on the world and how everything is apart from us and how it relates to us. And this is a sick worldview. It's part of the insanity of alcoholism. And it's so hard to see that that's part of the insanity. Alcoholism as an illness does not allow you the dignity of an accurate self-appraisal. It doesn't. If you're alcoholic and you haven't been through the steps and you've not recovered from alcoholism, you're not going to have a clue how much trouble you're really in or how deeply it affects every aspect of your life. It affects your relationships. It affects your ability to deal on any level in any way in your life as being negatively affected by Uh, by untreated alcoholism, if that's what you're experiencing. So living this way, living like I am an island and I've got to move through this hostile territory and, you know, make the moves that I need to make to be able to, to, to be okay for me, what that does is that sets me up to cause harm. It sets me up to, uh, uh, to do things uh, and, and behave in such a way that other people, other institutions are harmed. Uh, and that's not something that I can look very directly at. You know, with my experience with Step 8, I've done a number of Step 8s, uh, at least seven or eight. And each time I do them, something from the past comes up, something that I've missed. Um, I remember it was like my third or my fourth uh, run through the steps, And I was putting together an eight-step list, and something brought this back to me. You know, when I uh, right after leaving college and right after my first uh, first marriage uh, dissolved, I moved into this house with a bunch of partiers. I mean, these guys were nuts. One of them was a quaalude dealer. The other the other guy was just a drop-down, blackout drinking, you know, wild man. And I moved into this house and uh, we got kicked out because we were having loud, crazy parties and the music was on 10 and it was 3 in the morning and it was like a you know, little, little neighbor. So we got thrown out. So I got a drunken resentment one night because we're getting thrown out and uh, I talked everybody into trashing the house. I mean, we trashed this house. We ripped the door, every door in the house and made a bonfire in the backyard, and kicked in all the wall boards and... I, I got on the roof and kicked the chimney off the top of the house. I mean, we were just, this was not unusual behavior for us, unfortunately, back in these days. And I had forgotten about this. We'd move, we moved out like two weeks early, and, uh, you know, that was that. Um, and, and the, you know, it came to me that, you know, this is, this is a harm from, from my past that I've yet to take responsibility for. And this is like my third or my fourth run through the steps. So... Uh, so again, there's, a, there's an evolution to, uh, to these steps, and there's an evolution to the self-awareness that happens uh, in recovery. You become more and more aware of, uh, of reality in, an, in like a sane way. And I understand today that um, any, any, uh, any unresolved or undealt with harms that I've left out there in the universe are going to plague me in a, a number of different ways. You know, this isn't unusual, and it's not, it's not just from Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I mean, there's, we've, we've all heard of karma, good karma, bad karma. We've all heard of, you know, the golden rule and, you know, do unto others. Uh, we've, we've uh, uh, you know, in the uh, New Testament, uh, Jesus says, basically, if you want to come and pray at the altar, if you want to give your give your devotion at the altar and you have a problem with somebody, go fix that problem before you come to the altar. You know, this, this goes back thousands of years in all of the, the major uh, religions and philosophies that this unfinished conflict, unresolved conflict, is something that needs to be dealt with for spiritual growth. Now, the thing with the alcoholic is... Spiritual growth is not optional if you want to survive alcoholism. 
It's optional with a lot of other people. You can be a horse's ass for your whole life if you're not alcoholic. However, the alcoholic really doesn't have a lot of choice. There's got to be some spiritual growth. Now, I get into, I get into AA. I end up in AA. What happened was I went to the 28-day treatment program. They sent me to uh, outpatient. Outpatient recommended AA. You know, so okay, I'll go to AA. And, and I end up in AA. Now, I end up, I end up relapsing. Uh, drank for about seven more months. That took me to such an unbelievably ugly place in my life uh, that suicide was getting really attractive. It was getting so bad. And there was a little bit of survival instinct left in me uh, that said, go, go, back, go back to AA, go back to AA, you know, uh, and, and I did. And I came back in really hoping uh, against hope that this would work for me. Because I've got to tell you, the alcoholic is also an extreme. We're either better than or worse than. We're never run of the mill. We're never like average. You know, we're, we're always worse than or better than. And when I was looking around the rooms of AA and I had just come off this horrific, horrific seven months, I was judging everybody in the room saying, you know, these are not people that drank like me. These are not people that drank like me. They're talking, they're talking about tennis and about having problems with, you know, this one woman was sharing this one time. Well, you know, I bought a new house and I was trying to sell my other house and I can't say it, 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 uh, it's falling through and I'm stuck with these two houses. And this is a problem, right? And I'm thinking, how the hell do you get a house? You know, I got like seven bucks. So, so I mean, so like, you know, I'm, think, I'm thinking, I, you know, I, I don't know where these people are from, but like I'm, I, I, I drank, you know what I mean? And I drank with a vengeance and I was a psychopath when I was drunk and you know, marry two homes, you know, I, 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 got, I got nothing to do, I got nothing in common with, you know, so I really don't think this is going to work for me, you know, and, uh, and of course I was, uh, I was comparing, you know, people who were sober for periods of time with me who was like shattered and, you know, still stinking of vodka and bourbon. So I didn't think this AA thing would work, but, uh, but I tried it. Now, now, because alcoholism is a progressive illness, that capacity to be self-centered is also progressive. And by the time I came into AA, I can't even tell you how, how much I, was, I, w- I would you know, think about myself. I, I would go to these meetings and you know, I was learning how to share. You know, like uh, in the late 80s, early 90s meetings in my area in New Jersey, it was about going to meetings and sharing. You know, raise your, I'm going to share. Let me tell you about my day today. And uh, so I was, I was learning how to do that, you know, and uh, I was not very good at it, uh, but I was giving it my best shot. And I would go to a, a meeting, and it would be a gratitude meeting, and I'd share on gratitude. And then I'd go home, and the, and the ice cube tray would be, be empty. I'd be like, don't you know I need ice? What's the hell? You didn't fill the ice cube tray. I mean, you know, I was out of my, out of my mind, out of my mind. Uh, you know, the ice cube tray was empty for God's sake. Don't you know? I have to have cold drinks. Now, you know, the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Okay, you know, the, the great thing about recovery is it's progressive. The great thing about uh, your ability to experience what Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step process has to offer is it's, it, it's incremental. Uh, you get a little bit, if you continue to participate in this, you continue to, uh, to move forward uh, a little bit each day. And as, as I was, uh, you know, my first several years, as I was trying to move away from this selfishness and this self-centeredness, I got, uh, I got hooked up with some people who, um, who understood the step process. 
understood the step process in such a way that they understood the, uh, the, the actual mechanics of the steps. Again, in, in late 80s and early 90s AA, there, there may have been meetings that were about the practice of teaching and practicing the 12 steps, but in my area, it was about sharing, or there would be, uh, there would be the typical um, uh, Booker type of speaker meeting where uh, uh, you'd go to a speaker meeting and two speakers would come in and there'd be a leader. And you could get, you could get the knuckleheads of all time speaking at these things because there's no qualification or anything. Anybody that signs up can go speak. You know, they, they can be a, be a non-alcoholic wackadoo that shows up in the meeting and signs up and they're speaking in front of you, you know. So this is, th these, are the, these are the meetings that, uh, that, that I'm going to. And all of a sudden I get confronted with some people who truly shared their experience, their strength, and their hope on the 12-step recovery process and the best word I can describe it as actually. That's the best one word I could use. They actually told you how to, how to go through the steps and what the actual mechanics were. What, what it looks like when you do these steps. I was so confused. And really the reason I was confused was because I knew somewhere deep down inside that there had to be a fundamental change in me. I was so ill emotionally and spiritually, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to make it unless there wasn't some foundational change in the way I felt at the very least. And I saw the steps up on the wall and I understood that this was a 12-step fellowship. And I also understood that I needed to pay attention to and take these steps seriously. So I started to go to step meetings, 12 and 12 step meetings. I would say from 1990, the late part of 1990 to about 1992 or three, I was at least going to four step meetings a week. And in the step meetings, you, you, everybody in here I'm sure has been, has been to step meetings. Um, if you're thinking about actually doing the step and you're trying to learn how to actually do the step, that's probably the last place you want to go is a 12 and 12 step meeting. The 12 and 12 is an absolutely wonderful book, but it's non-instructional. It's more philosophical, and it's more like, you know, this is kind of what you can expect your attitude to change like. And you know, there's wonderful, wonderful, uh, poignant uh, 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 understanding of the alcoholic and the alcoholic mindset. But it's non-instructional as far as doing the step. So what will happen is you'll go to a lot of step meetings and think that you're doing the steps because you're going to a lot of step meetings. And nothing could be further from the truth. So, um, so I'm confused like crazy. Um, you know, I, I remember my, my first sponsor basically said, okay, Chris, you know, I guess it's time. Go ahead, do a fourth step. Go do a fourth step. Uh, you know, go to some four-step meetings, do a four-step. And that was the instruction I, I got from him. And what I did was I started to read the four-step and the 12 and 12. Look, if you're going to go through the steps, wouldn't you, wouldn't you pick up a step book as a reference source? Well, that's the worst thing you can do. But how do you know that? Anyway, I'm reading about the seven deadly sins, and I'm saying to myself, I, I, have, I have 12 <laughs> deadly sins. Uh, and, you know, and, and none of it made sense to me. What do I write down? You know, so I wrote down this life story because that's what I had been taught in, in treatment. So I put down this life story and, you know, I wrote down some of the nasty things I had did. I wrote down some of the things I had never told anybody before because I intuitively understood that you, you at least have to be confessional with some of this stuff. And I wrote down some patterns of behavior that I had wrong, you know, and I went off to do my fist step. And it was a great experience for me because, you know, I, I was not Catholic. I'd never experienced anything that was confessional ever in my life. I was taught, I don't know about you guys, but I was taught never admit to anything, even if they got you on video. You know, so it was really the first time I was ever honest with, uh, with, with anybody about this stuff. And I felt, a, I felt a great relief. 
I felt a great relief. I, I stopped thinking that, uh, that I, was, I was a scumbag. But it wasn't enough. Then I get, then I get um, exposed to these people who, uh, who understand the, the step process. They, they were from a, a haven of big bookers or something, you know, out, out west. And, and uh, you know, I started, I started listening to their tapes and started really studying this stuff. And, uh, and I started to begin to understand a little bit about how you do this this recovery process. Um, in uh, in step one, I admit uh, I admit powerlessness. Now, this is something so many of us miss. Powerlessness is powerlessness. You know, we'll ad- we'll admit that we're powerless over alcohol, and then we'll tell you what we do to keep ourselves sober. You know, that's a contradiction. Um, there's there's so much misunderstanding about step one. I understand today that step one is uh, the allergy of the body. That's pretty easy. The first drink always asks for the second with me. Second demands the third. The third insists on the fourth. I get tongue chewing, knee walking drunk practically every time alcohol goes into my body. That's an easy one. The obsession of the mind, though, is hard. For me to admit, it says, who among us wishes to admit complete defeat, it says in step one in the step book. Not me. I want to be able to do something or learn something that will keep me sober. But the fact of the matter is, is the first 50 pages of the big book paints a very bleak picture. It talks about the obsession of the mind. It talks about suddenly. It talks about uh, no human power can keep you from picking up the next drink or the next drug. It talks about the inability at certain times to bring into the consciousness the problems that alcohol has caused you in the past. You are without, you are without defense against the first drink. Now, to be without defense against the first drink means you're, you have nothing to do with when you drink again. Yet we like to get mad at our sponsees when they drink on us. Or the treatment centers like to kick us out, you know, if we sneak off and get drunk in the middle of a treatment program. Part of the illness is we are without defense against the next drink or the next drug. And that wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for, uh, you know, the unmanageability. And the unmanageability just presents in 150,000 different ways, mostly emotional, mostly spiritual uh, restlessness, irritability, discontent, uh, fear, self-centered fear, resentment, shame, remorse, guilt, uh, anxiety, depression. Those are all aspects of alcoholism. Those, that's, that's how unmanageability presents. Yet we, we want to think that we're depressed. Or we want to think we have anxiety disorders or whatever. What you have is untreated alcoholism, you know. And we're all dying from these things because we don't understand alcoholism. Um, that's the first step, and that's not good. The first step is it's Custer's last stand, and there's more Indians coming. If you get it, if alcoholism allows you a clear enough mind to understand how much trouble you're in, which it usually doesn't, you start to get the idea of how much trouble you're actually in, and how, and and why. Uh, if you're trying to get life insurance and you tell them you're an alcoholic, they'll deny you. You know, they know the alcoholic is 60 times more likely to take their own life than the non-alcoholic. They know the, the median age of the alcoholic is in the early 50s, you know. They know that. So, uh, so it's deadly. It's devastating. Step two. Maybe there's a way out. Come to believe that there's a power, there's a power that I can connect to that will restore me to sanity, that will enable me to stay away from the next drink or the next drug. I can't do it myself. That's what the first step says. But the second step says that there's a power that can be grasped. You know, so often I'm, I deal with, uh, with people who come in who have uh, really negative impressions of God uh, and religion and, you know, just bizarre conceptions that have been built up by people who have kindergarten mentality about 
uh, spiritual matters, you know, and they've they've impregnated us with these bizarre uh, impressions of what God looks like, and you know, how, you know, and and, mor- and how morality ties into it, and, you know, and it, it just completely bizarre. You know, today I see uh, I see God as more of a verb than a noun. I see God as more of a power because that's what I can experience. I can experience today that power that keeps me safe and protected from the next drink or the next drug. Um, Can I define that? Can I uh, give you a list of all the attributes and put a face on it? Not with any real confidence, no. But I can tell you that by living uh, uh, living a spiritual life, and following spiritual directions through the 12 steps, I've, been, uh, I've encountered this power at a fundamentally deep level. It says in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the consciousness of the presence of God. You know, we will know the... Con- we, we, will, we will understand that God is doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves this will be the most significant fact in our lives, the book says. And that's true. That's true in my case. I, 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 I understand that I need to participate. I need to participate in uh, the spiritual life for me to stay connected to this power. But I haven't had a drink. I haven't had a drink in almost 22 years. And that's a miracle. If you would have seen me in the late 80s, you would have said this guy's not going to live another month. That's how bad I was, I was drinking. So I know that this power is real, and I know that you can hook into it, and anyone can. And it doesn't, it doesn't take a religious attitude. What it takes is it takes a behavioral attitude. We need to come to terms with spiritual living and do them. And that does not make us lame or chumps or anything like that. It makes us more effective people on this planet. It really does. So in step three, now I need to decide, okay, I know I'm dead on my own. I'm dead. It's only a matter of time drinking myself to death. Some horrific, you know, misadventure is going to happen. You know, my liver will explode. Something bad. I know. But, if, but I come to believe that by trying to live life on spiritual terms, I can hook into a power. If I believe that maybe that's possible, then the next step is step three, where I make, make the decision to do that. Okay, I got, I got no better plans. I'm all in. You know, uh, show me what to do. And I did that on like day three or day four with my first sponsor. I went up to him and I said, Phil, I've been in hell I need to get out. Tell me what to do. Those are the words I said to him two days in. Tell me what to do. And I might as well have said, be very careful about telling me what to do because, God damn it, I'm going to do it. You know, so be very careful what you tell me to do because I am that desperate that I'm going to listen to you about my life, which was already, you know, alert the press. Chris is going to be paying attention to somebody else's opinion. You know, uh, what I learned later from, uh, from the big book guys is it's a decision to go through the rest of the steps. How do I live life along spiritual lines? The steps are spirituality 101. A lot of it are, are things that we should have learned in kindergarten but you know, decided not to. So, okay, step three, I'm in. I want to start developing a relationship with this power that's keeping me sober. I want to start living life along spiritual lines. And I'm willing willing to at least be willing to go through the rest of the steps. Not real happy about eight and nine. You know, not real happy about sharing all my faults with anybody, but I'm willing. So in step four, that's my first face-to-face look really at what is going on with me. I have been wrong about so much. My attitudes, my opinions, my outlook have been wrong and tainted with this perverse, deep-seated self-centeredness 
that I can't see the truth from the false. I can't really see right from wrong. I can't really see the damage that I'm doing you. I can't really see how selfish I am until I start to look at step four. I start going through step four and I start to put some of the pieces together about what is wrong with me. Has anybody in here ever been asked that question by somebody? What is wrong with you? Are you crazy? Anybody ever been asked that? Well, the first time you're really going to understand uh, what's wrong with you is when you start looking at the fourth step. No matter what you think, it's the first time you're going to really start to see what's going on with you is when you look at the first step, fourth step. And when you start to put a four-column resentment inventory together, when you start to do a fear inventory, when you start to look at the harms that you've caused other people, especially in the sex realm, uh, the sex harms that you've caused. Because alcoholics, picture being terminally self-centered and getting in relationships. How's that going to look? That's going to be like one Hindenburg explosion after another, probably. And, it's, and you're going to be basing all of your actions and relationship skills on selfishness and self-centeredness. That ain't going to go well. So that's an inventory that needs to be looked at. That's basically nine questions, uh, a review, nine questions, and then putting together uh, an ideal for future relationships, future, future, um, uh, future encounters, uh, close encounters with other people. And all of that needs to be put together. And if you've done even a halfway good job on this, you have discovered some unbelievable things about yourself and how you have caused your own problems. If you've done a good job with step four, you get to a place where you, you no longer think your problems are coming at you. You understand your problems are coming from you. And that is a shift in perception that is absolutely huge. Because now you know whose fault it really is. It's not those bastards. It's you. You have co-created at best everything that's going wrong in your, in your life. At worst, you've caused it all. And you only see that when you do a four-step. You, when you get done with this four-step, the next spiritual exercise is to share it with somebody. You know, sharing it with somebody takes, uh, takes some of the sting out of it. I mean, because it really is the whole Megillah. It's like, it's like you know, a, a treatise on every dysfunctional thing that's ever going on in your life. It's, it's really, uh, you know, an almost toxic document. <clears throat> and sharing it with somebody, especially somebody who has some experience with this, is a, is a good thing because what will happen is uh, you'll start to see that you're not so unique. You know, you're not so unique. You, uh, you've been caught up, you've been driven into this by alcoholism. Um, you probably wanted to be a much better person than you ended up being. This is an illness. If we're powerless, then we're being driven into this. So where we need to start to take responsibility at this point is with the recovery process. One of the promises is we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we don't shut the door on the past, uh, uh, and we don't. Uh, we can use that as, uh, as an asset moving forward. We can use it as a motivation to continue on the spiritual path. We can use it to figure out uh, an eight-step list and where we've done harms and start to put that, uh, put that list together. But it, it starts to lose its sting and we start to get some perspective. I believe a spiritual awakening, I believe a miracle is a shift in perception. You see things one way and then there's a prof profound event in your life and then you're looking at the exact same thing with a complete different pair of glasses. It's a complete different perspective, complete different perception. And uh, that's what happens to us uh, as far as, you know, when we go through these steps. We, we go from a foundation built on selfishness and self-centeredness to uh, a new foundation that's built on, uh, on compassion and spiritual values. And uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to have happen.
So as we're, uh, as we're finishing up our fifth step and we're sharing all this stuff, if we've, if we've done the best we can with it, if we've truly held nothing back and really went after this step with everything we had, uh, there's a whole, whole series of promises that are amazing that happen. And that moves you very quickly into, into step six, which is uh, becoming willing to have God remove these defects of character. Now think of it this way. If you're truly powerless... If you've been driven into this alcoholism, into this behavior because of alcoholism, which I truly believe today. I truly, I, truly, I, th- I think that we're good people that do bad things. I think sometimes we're smart people that do stupid things. We're being driven into this stuff by alcoholism. So in step six, when we become willing to have God remove these defects of character, we have to admit that, look... If we could have changed our lives with a couple of self-help books, we would have done so a long time ago. Anybody in here uh, get sober with a whole library of self-help books that didn't work? There's three hands and the rest of you lying good for nothings. So God needs to remove these defects of character. They are too much for me. I cannot decide not to be selfish anymore and have that last more than 15 minutes. It's not in my nature. It takes way, a way greater power than myself for these defects of character to be mastered. So I become willing to let God remove these defects of character. And, and in step seven, I, I humbly, in an attitude of humility, an attitude of humility basically is, I believe humility is an accurate self-appraisal. I believe humility is understanding my position in all this. And if I understand that these character defects, like my alcoholism, are too much for me in single-handed combat, I can go to God or the power in an attitude of humility. I'm beaten. I have surrendered. Please take these character defects from me and, you know, say the, uh, the, the, the seventh step prayer. And I believe that prayers are answered. Uh, I have, my experience with character defects being removed is, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them that get removed. Yes, my whole deportment shouts that I am no longer as selfish and self-centered as I used to be. I have the actual capacity today to think of other people before myself, which is a wholesale miracle. You know, I truly believe that that, that, uh, that, that change did not originate within me. It's, it's not something that I achieved out of a sense of virtue. It's something that has happened by my cooperation to live a spiritual life, and it's almost a byproduct of my cooperation to live a spiritual life. So I humbly ask God to remove these uh, shortcomings, holding nothing back. Now I'm looking at step eight, which is, which is tonight's topic. Became willing to make amends to those that I had harmed. Now, the best possible atmosphere for the removal of character defects that are robbing you of all the quality that your life could have. The best possible spiritual atmosphere for the removal of those defects of character is to humbly become willing to make amends and to actually go out and make amends for where those, uh, those, harm, uh, those actions, your selfish actions have, have caused harm. Now, I like to keep the two disciplines separate. There's the discipline of becoming willing and doing the list. And then there's the discipline of actually going out and making amends. And those really are two separate disciplines. And I like to keep them separate for one reason. We have the capacity to edit our A-step list. We can be putting a list together and we can be deciding who we're going to make amends to and who we're not going to make amends to and make sure that the people we're not going to make amends to don't get on the list. That's something that I think a majority of alcoholics have experienced who've, who've, uh, who've tackled these steps. Not everybody, but probably a majority. Now, here's why you want to keep the disciplines separate. If you do the A step the way 
it's supposed to be done, you will put down everyone on that list. You'll put down every creditor. You'll put down everyone that you had serious turbulence with in your life. You'll put down every single person that you're aware of at the time that you've caused harm to or every institution because that's the discipline. If you don't edit ahead. And the reason why I think that that should be done is uh, I think the willingness uh, to do certain amends comes with experience. In other words, there may be people on your A-step list that you are not, you don't have the spiritual fortitude right here and right now to be able to do that amends. And that's fine. A um, good friend of mine uh, came to me one time. He had about 60 amends on cards. And he said, uh, he said, Chris, you know, I'm good with most of this, but there's a card in here I want to talk to you about. He goes, there's a card in here, and I want you to know, as soon as we're, you need to know right away that I am not going to make amends to this guy. Now, this individual had harmed, harmed somebody in his family in a, in, a, in a very profound way. And he had uh, had the person prosecuted. And it was a mess, okay? And this person ended up on his A-step cards. And he said, I am never going to make amends to this person. Just so you know, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do what I can do here, but I'm never going to make amends to this person. Well, what happened was he did 59 amends out of 60, and this one card started to burn, started to burn him. And he, he came over to me at my house and he said, you know, I, you got to help me with this. I, 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 don't, I, I know now I've got to do this amends. And you, you need to help me. I'm willing, I just don't know how to do it. And we talked about it, and he actually went out and made that amends, and he completed his 60 amends. And the guy has never been the same since. Um, that willingness that they talk about in step eight, sometimes it's got to come with the experience of doing the ones that you're willing. There are going to be amends that you're willing to do right away. I, 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 for one, this is what, you know, there's people who have different opinions. I, for one, believe that you should do the ones that you're willing to do. And with that experience, what happens is you become willing to do the ones that you were unwilling to do. Each step, each step gives you the power to do the next step. Uh, each action that we take allows us to, uh, to go a little bit further into this spiritual life. In the step book, there's a, there's a saying, the hoop that you have to jump through is larger than you think. You know, when we're looking at these steps from the ground floor, uh, they can seem daunting. They can seem impossible. I'll never be able to do that. But you need to know that there's nothing in those steps that if done correctly will hurt you, and there's nothing in those steps that will be impossible for you if you just remain willing and open-minded. Now, uh, Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big thing with step eight. Um, there was a shift. I told you about the shift that happened to me in the fourth step. All of a sudden I realized that uh, my problems were of my own making. I was an example of self-will run riot, though I didn't think so. And I stepped on the toes of my fellows and they retaliated, seemingly without provocation. And I start to understand that I've caused this big mess in my life. With that understanding comes a lot of forgiveness because I no longer see people and the universe as hostile to me. I see my relationship with people in the universe as being defective because I'm alcoholic and I'm living my life based on self-centered fear. So that makes it easier, easier for me to start to forgive some people because I don't see them as aggressors anymore. I see them as, you know, unwilling bit players really in my life. You know, most of the time I'm the one that dragged them in anyway. And if it's, if it's family, you know, I, I, I so totally abused my relationship with every family member. It was amazing that they had anything to do with me you know, around the, around the time at the end of my drinking. So, so I started to shift my perspective. I started to look at things differently. 
And that's where a lot of, um, a lot of forgiveness comes in. If you want to have a quality of life, if you want to understand serenity, if you want to have peace, you have to deal with forgiving everything. Now, forgiveness does not necessarily mean tolerance. You, you know, um, acceptance does not necessarily mean tolerance. There's certain things that we do not have to tolerate. However, we need to accept them and we need to forgive the people. Uh, we need to f- be able to forgive the people because if we don't, if we don't, it's going to be a backlash. Uh, our unwillingness to forgive is going to turn around and poison and corrode our own spirituality. And it's our, our spirituality is what is going to keep us alive. It's what's going to keep us on this planet without dying an alcoholic death. Look, being an alcoholic, uh, the statistical chances are really bad for your survival. You'd be better off having any other type of cancer or heart disease than you would having alcoholism. Because alcoholism, there's a high, high, high percentage of people who die from alcoholism. If we pay attention to this stuff, if we engage in it and we stay consistent with it, we can die with alcoholism instead of from alcoholism. And I don't know about anybody else, but I I was not a good person toward the end. And what I've learned of alcoholism is it's progressive. My alcoholism is way worse now than it was 21 years ago when I quit. It has been progressing, waiting for a drink. If I picked up a drink tomorrow, um, most likely I would be rocketed into an incredibly dark place, an incredibly violent, insane, dark place. And I don't want to end my existence on this planet that way. I don't think that's what God wants for me. So I need to take... Look at it this way. If you have... Diabetes, it's your responsibility to take insulin and watch your diet. If you don't, diabetes will kill you. If you have hypertension or if you've got uh, you know, uh, really serious kidney problems and you need dialysis, it's your responsibility to get the dialysis. You can't say... Well, there's you know a football game on tonight. I'll do dialysis tomorrow. No, you you need to take responsibility for it on a day-to-day basis. Well, with alcoholism, because it's an unorthodox illness and the treatment is unorthodox, we and, and there's a, a level of delusion that we don't think we're really sick. What happens is we forget to pay attention to the treatment to the participated patient in the treatment of our alcoholism and we'll start to back away from meetings we'll 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 not pay a lot of attention to the 12 steps we'll see that we don't have to work with other people that we don't have to do service commitments we can get away with it you know tonight i can get away with you know just sitting at home and watching tv and this will build up and what will happen is we will relapse the american uh, medical society uh in the, uh, in the DSM-4, uh, which is the, the newest, latest, and greatest diagnostic manual for diseases and, and illnesses that doctors use, uh, alcoholism is defined as a chronically relapsing condition. Um, my particular uh, understanding of relapse is drinking again, but that's not necessarily uh, the way a lot of doctors will look at it. They'll look at, uh, they'll look at anxiety attacks, emotional disturbances, depression, They'll see that as a relapse of alcoholism because the person isn't treating, uh, treating the alcoholism uh, the right way and they'll prescribe for you or whatever. But if, if the doctors see alcoholism as a chronically relapsing condition, you can bet that there's a high percentage of people that come into AA or try to stay sober that can't or don't. I love the way Bill Wilson says that. Uh, There are people who cannot or will not give themselves to this simple program. Don't don't kid yourselves. Giving yourself to this simple program is making amends to the people or institutions who you've caused harm to. Setting right the wrong. Don't kid yourself and think 
that giving yourself to this simple program is going to meetings. Meetings do not treat alcoholism. They create a tentative sobriety. And the next step from meetings is a recovery program, the 12 steps. If you just come in and sit in meetings and you've been here 100 years and everything is fine, you, you don't even qualify as an alcoholic if you look at the description in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It basically ensures that if all you're going to do is go to meetings, you're going to drink again. If you read the black part of the book, so don't, uh, don't kid yourself that this is something that can be treated like going to the Rotary Club. I made that mistake early on. I was showing up in meetings. I was doing it like it was castor oil treatment. I don't like it, but I'm going to show up. And I was going to outpatient. I was going to AA. And on the way to an AA meeting one night, it, I concluded that it would be a good idea to buy a gallon of vodka and drink it. And it was the craziest thought that ever went through my mind because it created seven months of the, the, a living hell. And I was a meeting maker. I was, I was going outpatient. And uh, I was a meeting maker that didn't make it. So when I came back in, I intuitively understood there had to be something deeper and more profound here for me to be able to stay sober and to survive. And I found that it's right up on the wall at every meeting. And we read it at every meeting. How it works. I, and still I'll go to a meeting. It's more rare today, but still I'll go to a meeting and somebody will raise their hand. And go, I don't know how it works. It just works. What do you mean you don't know how it works? We read how it works at every meeting. How it works is how it works. It's how it works some crazy reason we came up with this idea that going to 90 and 90 is a treatment for alcoholism. Trust me, it's not. The next step after step 8 is obviously step 9. And then we have 10, 11, and 12. At the end of this thing, if we go to the last chapter in the book, we see that what we need to do is we need to have a life based on service, love and service. Uh, Dr. Bob had this pegged. He went through the steps in a matter of days and was on service the rest of his life. And he had it pegged. He had a great, great recovery of this guy. All he was about was taking other people through the steps. That's what he did on a daily basis. He took you through the steps. Meetings were optional to him. The steps were essential. And he did that for another 15 years until he died from 35 to 50. He worked with thousands of alcoholics. If you do the math, it was two or three a day or something like that that this guy worked with, being a service. We need to all of a sudden have more, uh, more of um, a desire to help other people than to put ourselves first says in the book uh, Alcoholics Anonymous that uh, we relapse because we fail to enlarge and perfect our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. That's where it tells us why we relapse. Because we fail to participate in our spiritual life and we fail to work for others and place their welfare ahead of our own. Um, when I first walked into AA, I had no clue I was going to need to do that. I really thought I was going to end up drinking a lot of coffee and sitting in a lot of church basements, you know, talking about God, and I didn't understand any of this. Today I've got experience with this. Uh, I'm incredibly happy to, uh, to be where I am today. I've got a, a pretty remarkable life. Um, you know, in the last couple of years there's been ups and downs and sidewayses. And, you know, stuff that would have killed me, you know, when I was drinking. I couldn't stand change when I was drinking. Well, I've moved about five times. Uh, uh, I married a wonderful woman. I'm in a new marriage, you know, new job, you know, back and forth between states, running all over the country, doing crazy things, you know, getting involved with just people all over the country doing wacky recovery stuff. And... Uh, 
I got to tell you, I, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, am, uh, I truly now understand it. When I first walked into AA and heard somebody raise their hand and say, I'm a grateful alcoholic, I was like, oh, brother, here's a grateful alcoholic. I'll let me slash the tires of your car in the meeting and then watch you find them all flat and see how grateful you are after the meeting, you bastard, you loser. I'm on the other side of that now. <laughs> And I understand at a very, very deep level what a grateful alcoholic is, and I'm one of them. Thank you very much for, for being here tonight.